الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have the pleasure today to have Brother Ahmad Didat with us. I suppose everybody of us knows Ahmad Didat. Alhamdulillah, he is a very well known da'iyah. He has devoted his life for Islam. He is working for Islam in South Africa. We know the Islamic Propagation Center, which he established and working for Islam there in South Africa. But however, he's not only well known in South Africa, he's well known, alhamdulillah, all over the world. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given him the knowledge and the sensibility to understand maybe the other religion which dominates a large part of the world. That's to say Christianity. Alhamdulillah, Brother Ahmad Ida is so knowledgeable about it that the Christians themselves, once you are Muslim, then you have the light. You can see the truth sometimes even between the lines, even when these lines are corrupt. So Alhamdulillah, Brother Ahmad Ida conveys the message of Islam to the Christians from their own holy book. He tells them where the faults are where the difficulties are. At the same time, he tells them that he knows this, he knows this truth because he knows the full truth revealed from Allah to our Prophet Brother Ahmad Dirat was debating recently in Albert Hall with one of the Arab Christians from Palestine. And MashaAllah, Brother Ahmad Dirat has given him the lesson to so him and to everybody, if they have sins, if they make sins, the light is clear for everybody to see, but he needs to have the eyes in order to see that light. So those people, after Brother Ahmad did that, so for them, if they deny the truth any further, they just want to deny it, although they see it. Brother Ahmad did that, inshallah, is going to talk to us today. I believe all of all of us here are young du'a. We hope, inshallah, one day we will devote more time for da'wah. So, Brother Ahmed Bilal has got a message for us to convey. And inshallah, he's going to talk about Christmas. Ask him why. <laughs> so, ask Brother Ahmed that the team of the conference is going to talk to the Muslims in the West, the way ahead. He said, no, it's going to be the talk time is going to be Christmas. So I said, oh, inshallah. <laughs> All right. So inshallah, I leave you to, I leave you to Mother Ahmed to talk to you about Christmas. Between brackets, Muslims in the West, the way ahead. <laughs> قالت رب أن يكون لي ولد ولم يمسك بشر قال كذلك الله يخلق ما يشاء إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and my dear children I know that topic that has been uh, announced to you is quite an amusing topic that coming to a Muslim conference of young men and women and talking about Christmas, has anything gone wrong with Uncle Gita? It's not right in his head. <laughs> but I don't think that anything has gone wrong yet. You see, last Friday, I was at the East London Mosque. And um, there were a lot of young boys and girls, Westerners, Christians, white people. They were visiting the masjid in East London, the one right on the main road, some chapel road or something like that, the big masjid. And uh, after showing them around, the guy took, him, took them to a small room and he was going to answer their questions. 
So they invited me, and one of the questions that the student, the Christian, asked, do you Muslims celebrate Christmas? So I said yes, and I said no. I said yes, in the sense that Christmas is a public holiday. <laughs> Like in my country, always around Christmas time, about four days holiday we have. Christmas day, Boxing day, and then some other day towards the weekend. We have about four days holiday ever, almost every year. So that is an occasion for us to go and arrange our weddings, meet our friends, our relations, and we have a jolly good time. Not like you think drinking and dancing, but in an innocent way, we have a good time. Thank you very much for giving us these four days. You know, our government, they do that. So from that angle, I said, we do celebrate Christmas. But we do not commemorate the birthday of Jesus on the day, on the 25th of December. Because, we said, Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. If we knew his exact date of birth, as we commemorate Mila, the birthday of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I said, why should we not? Celebrate the birthday of Jesus. Don't we believe in him? Don't we? We do. Why are you afraid to say yes? <laughs> we do believe in Jesus Christ as one of the mightiest messengers of God, as the Messiah, the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission, of healing those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. If you say you don't believe in Jesus, you're not a Muslim. So, since we believe in him, and if you knew his date of birth, why should we not commemorate Christmas, the birth of Christ? But since the 25th of December is not his birthday, it is actually the birthday of the pagan god. See, the sun god, not the son of God in inverted forms. It is the birth of the sun god. I said, you see, according to the Quran and the Bible, Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. According to the Quran and the Bible. In the Bible we are told that when Jesus was born, the shepherds were out in the field with their flocks at night. And Palestine is in the northern hemisphere. In winter, in midwinter, 25th of December, it is as cold as Mary England. So, if the shepherds were out in the field in midwinter, like this, in the field, the shepherds would freeze to death and the sheep would freeze to death. <laughs> So, if the shepherds were out in the field, it would not have been in December, number one. Number two, the Holy Quran tells us that when Jesus was born, Mary, his mother, she had retired to a remote place in the east. And when the child was born, the voice was heard, telling her that there is a river here, wash yourself, refresh yourself, and get hold of a palm leaf, and pull towards herself, and shake it, and it will let fall, fresh, ripe dates. Dates, you? It will let fall. So, when will you have fresh, ripe dates on palm trees that you can shake them down? In summer, mid-summer, not mid-winter. <laughs> so, from the Islamic authority, we know it could not be December. And with the Christian authority, we know that it was not December. So, you are commemorating the birth of a sun god, not the son of God. See the primitive man, in this northern region, in the Mediterranean region, as winter approached, you could see the sun going backward and back, backward in the southern hemisphere, receding from them, receding. And day by day it started getting colder and colder, 28th of December, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, it's getting colder and colder, and there was only by this as the devil trying to swallow the sun, the happenings in the heavens, astronomically, that the devil was following the sun, and by the king people, they felt, they would see the primitive man, they would see a very little different variation in temperature, they would feel and relate to some other happening. They said, you see, now the, uh, the, the prince of darkness, the devil, has been overcome by the sun, and the sun is reborn, it is born again, the sun coming back into its own 25th, 26th, 27th, getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So 25th of December was the turn of the tide in the heavens. So the sun is being born. Sun, the sun, not the sun of God. 
So this is the pagan holiday. The pagans create uh, had a holiday. And since the Christians came on the scene, they saw that these people were commemorating around that day, so they adopted that day and they started celebrating Christmas. If we really knew, I said we would have no hesitation in commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ. But 25th of December is not. I read this verse to you from the Holy Quran, from Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 47. Where when the good news was given to Maryam about the birth of the Holy Son, she said, Qalat Rabbi anna yakununi waladun wa lam yam sasli basha. She says, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? So the angel says in reply, Qalat Rabbi anna yakununi waladun wa lam yam sasli basha. Even so, Allah prays for evil. Iza qala amran fa inna ma yakul lahu kun fa yakun. So whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says to him, be and it is. This is the most important of the Lord of Jesus. This, this. You know that the good news was given and she may carry the child for nine months according to this Bashara uh, and the child was born. Now, there is an eternal confrontation between the Muslims and the Christians. Allah reminds about this. In the Holy Quran, it says, "Walan tarda anta al-Yahudu, walan nasara hatta tatabiya billah." That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslim, unless you follow the brand of religion. Either you opt out if you want peace, become Christian, or change them. It's one of the, there is no satisfaction otherwise. You want to become a Jew or a Christian? The Jew says, "You follow." For example, religious, if the Jews have been thrown in the power, they are not prepared to convert you. They don't want anybody other than the Jew. They have made the religion a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. They only want political recognition. You recognize that they are entitled to Palestine and there's peace with them if you want peace that way. Give in, give in. They say, look, Palestine is hers. The great grandfathers you know, had it at one time and they have come to take back that inheritance if you want peace with them. They say, this is the only thing they want now. Political recognition. They don't want to convert you. You are Gentiles. Hebrew Goyim means filthy, dirty, unclean people, impure people. They don't want you. Keep out. Keep out. Judaism is a racial preserve. The Christian is knocking at our door. And he is making life miserable for our people all over the world. There are at the present moment 42,000 American crusaders in the world. Americans alone. Out of the world, 70,000 missionaries, not priests, pastors or ministers of the church. No. These are the crusaders. There are 70,000 out of them, 42,000, 60% are Americans. And they are raising the dust throughout the world. In Pakistan. In Bangladesh, in Indonesia, in Africa, wherever they are yeah. raising the dust, telling us that you Muslims are going to hell. There is only one way for you to go to heaven is, as they say, Allah tells us, Waqalut, and they say, Lan yadhul al jannata illa man kana abudan nasara. That you Muslims will never, never enter jannah. There is no heaven for you, illa except. Mankana Buddha Masara, unless you become Jew or unless you become a Christian. In answer to that, Allah says, Tilka Amani Yuhum, that this is the wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. Full, tell them, ha, Google ha. Produce your evidence, your proof, your certificate that entitles you to Jannah and destines us to Jahannam, to hell. Let's have a look at the certificate. Full ha, Google in Kunikun Swati team, which has given the truth, let us have a look at your proof, your certificate. And they have produced it. The certificate in 2,000 different languages. The Bible. Says that my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. You want to swallow it? This is proof. Allah says, when Allah commands us to demand proof, it presupposes that the proof is produced, you will be able to analyze it. Otherwise it makes no sense. So they have produced the proof 
and they're presenting through the Bible, knocking at our doors, telling us that we're going to hell. In our own homes, they eat our, they drink our tea, they eat our samosas and our bhajas and our kusistas and our jalebis, and they're sending us to hell. And we are sitting tired, sitting ducks for these people because we have no knowledge of how to give battle, how to defend yourself. We have no knowledge. We are good Muslims, maybe. You know, we know how to pray, we know how to make wudu, how many sunnah, how many nafil, how many wajib in the, in the wudu, that we know. We know what said, uh, the length of the beard, how long it short should be, whether the mustache should be shaved or trimmed, that we know, all that we know. But we don't know how to give battles to this guy who's not in the world law, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Dutch Reformed Churches, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Methodists, they're all trying to make inroads into the community. And your presence here in this country, most of you seem to be like foreign. You are not all Britishers. Maybe half a dozen of you might be born there. But the bulk of you coming from Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, wherever, they are all foreign in this country. And you are making their mouth water. You, you, you. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Huh? You think I'm joking? <laughs> you see, these are the publications. I don't know whether you have come across that. Islam comes to Britain. Beautiful production. Beautiful. This is a picture of the Regent Park Mosque, the Central Mosque in London. I showed it this to Dr. Bhopan, the director. I said, you see this? Islam comes to Britain. He said, that's our mosque. I said, yes, but you didn't bring this. You didn't bring this. I said, it's a Christian city. I said, what for? They are trying to terrify the people that Islam is coming to Britain. Now these people are going to make inroads into our society, do something, change them before they change us. Before we change them, they must change us. Then the Canadians from Canada, they had a society, a body called International Crusaders. Crusaders, you know the Mujahids of Crusaders. You talk about dying, 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 and everyone going to deliver the message. They are crusaders. They want to do crusades. In early days, they had the crusade, you know, we fought it out with them. But now, there's another type of intellectual crusade. They want to wage against our people. And they have come all the way from Canada and they made their headquarters in Birmingham. Why Birmingham? I didn't know. You see, about three or four times, twice or thrice, I have come here before. Where this you gentlemen? Mm -hmm. And women. I didn't know at that time that Birmingham was the center of England, more or less. And it was the second largest city in the UK. That also I didn't know. So they, they have transported the, the this thing, headquarters to Birmingham. And Birmingham, they're saying something here, so what is making the mouth water? You know, you make your mouth water when you're very hungry and you smell burning meat. What happens to you? You know, your mouth starts watering when you're hungry. So it's making the Christian's mouth water. It says here, yeah, our strategy, the strategy of the International Crusaders. So our goal is to field an English-speaking team to Birmingham to work amidst the 25,000 Bengali Muslims. At least. Bengali Muslims, 25,000. I don't know that so many Bengali Muslims in Birmingham. What they say? And there will be other Pakistanis and Hindustanis and Malaysians and all in Birmingham. Expatriates, people who have come to eat out a living, poor people, illiterate people, ignorant people. They are Muslims by name, all of us. So, is there God, is God said, opportunity for them. They change their title from international crusaders to international teams. So you might you take part of that. If there's a crusaders, Zawa, this once more again. You know the old story comes to mind. He says, no, 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 no. So they change the title to T, international T. They no longer they tell you why they change it. How to catch a fish. They you know. As a fish is easy to catch as a team. International team. Maybe football team, maybe tennis team, maybe what? The basketball team. Team. Or the team. But no more crusaders. And they're knocking at our doors. And they're telling the people, look, we are very fortunate in this day and age. 
These people are coming to our doors. These students, these laborers, these businessmen, they are coming to our doors, to our country. So it's making our task easy for us. Three years, prior to this, prior to 50 years. He says, you know, we have to go to their countries, in the East, in the Orient. We have to go to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to India, to Pakistan, Bangladesh, these names didn't exist, but those territories, you know what we are talking about. Thousands of miles away from home. Away from the home base. Now, we can work from the home base. We can sleep with our wife and children, and in the morning we can get out and we find the customers around us. They can come the and they can work till late in the evening, and back home in the evening they can sleep with the wife and children. Prior, prior to this, thousand, five thousand miles away, ten thousand miles away, away from the home base. Now they can go and work from the home base. You make that easy for him. Number two, he said, culturally, these people are backward people. You know, when we went to Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, when we went to village. The guy welcomes us, but he has to sit on the floor on the grass mat. The flies are buzzing all around. And the smoke is coming from the kitchen, the stove. You know, the open stove. And we're smarting our eyes. The eye is watering, the nose is watering. And we have to talk to the fellow. No more, no more. Culturally, this guy is prepared to receive us with your sofa and kursi. Huh? And the dining room table and the chairs. You can give them tea and cakes. Or sitting. No more on the ground. Culturally, you are now prepared to receive the message. Number two. Number three, he said, previously, we had to learn the language of the natives. Wherever we went, we went to Bangladesh. We must learn Bengali to talk to the Bengali. When we went to Indonesia, we had to learn Indonesian to talk to the Indonesian. When we went to, to Northwest, we had to learn Pushtu to talk to the Pathan. When we went to the other part, we had to learn Urdu. Wherever we went, we had to learn the language of the natives. No more. These guys, they are now learning our language. Are you? You can't do without that. You have to learn his language. So we are already prepared to receive the message. He doesn't have to learn your language. You have already learned his. Linguistically, you are not prepared to receive the message. No? Number four. He said, previously, if we could work as an individual, in any villages, in any of these countries, name, he becomes a sore tongue in the community. Everybody sees him as that hadith that when there is a the murta tafir. You know, you feel like strangling him, no? Your own brother, your cousin, your nephew, your relation, he'll become a murta, a tafir. How do you feel? So you feel like it. And the whole, whole community, the whole community, the village, the town, everybody is activated against him. You don't like him, you don't want to see him, you don't want to kill him, murder him. Your child is lost. When well, you go to hell now, he's become an apostate. He's not cursing, abusing, and swearing over the me. How do you feel? But now, no more. We are 60 million. And in the 60 million, we can easily absorb these guys now. You, 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 you. Easily absorb. It's all over. Number five. So previously, the dogs, or even not the dogs, they can do nothing about it, but they're not happy. Because they are creating a potential big problem in our midst. In Pakistan, in the Punjab, there are certain places in the Punjab where they have, the, the Christians are in the majority. They have converted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. They have converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. Fifteen million Indonesians have been converted already into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And there's every chance that it's going to happen. The way things are moving. Everything is in the favor of the Christians. It's a loaded thing against the Muslims. We were boasting at one time, we are the biggest country, Muslim country in the world, the biggest Islamic Muslim population in the world, Indonesia. I said, not what happens today, not what happens. Your 100 million, 140 million is rubbish. Ready like grass, cut and ready to be burned. 140 million, not what happens. This is what has happened. So, but the government, like in Pakistan, is not happy. 
So, yeah, yeah. Zia, yeah, Zia, yeah, Zia, yeah, he can do nothing. I don't know who's ruling in Bangladesh, but who can do nothing. It's the mission of Islam. But in his heart of heart, they are not happy. But here, change the people, convert them, and the government is happy. Absorb them. All this, let them come. When they come, absorb them. We can make them into wine. We have bigger market for our wine industry. We have more big eaters from now on. We have more fabulous, more promiscuous people. You know? so we want to make them all our own. Can happen. It's really needed. Things do happen. When you tie a horse to a donkey, we are told. When you tie a horse to the donkey, the horse can't bray like a donkey. But we have a saying that it lifts up his head. It tries to imitate the donkey. That horse is weak. You know, try to imitate like a white Try to behave like him. You know, stand as our norms. All this is we want to make them one cheaper. So five points against us. Because of you here. Yeah. You don't have to learn your language, culturally from every point of view. Ah, you are ready for housing. So what are we to do? You can't isolate yourself, you can't insulate yourself. You say, no, 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 you want to no, keep out, nobody can help you. No, no. You can't help against you. It is in your body, it's in your home. The guard comes and knocks at your door. You can't say, put side, get away, rubbish, I don't want to talk to you. I, I can defend myself. And our sisters also say, no, we know Islam is in the right and we can defend ourselves. Against what? You see, previously these people, they had some systems of attacking Islam and the Holy Prophet. That Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had told me why. He spreads the religion at the point of the sword. It means he forced Islam down people's throats. If you don't accept Islam, chop up your head. They said, the Quran was copied by our Nabi from the Jews and the Christians. This was the type of thing that they did. And it didn't gather much money. No controversy. They have changed their tactics, different, different tactics. Today now, they have learned new methods. Now they come to you. This is what's happening in my country, I'm sure. They're trying the same things with you here. Because they plan, master plans. How to do the job, Tawa. Now they come to us. This is, you know, Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. How will you respond? What do you say? He said, yes, indeed. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He says, you know, Jesus was the Masih, the Messiah. Masih Allah translated Christ. Christ is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Arabic, Masih. So Jesus is the Masih Allah. is Allah's Messiah, Masih. What do you say? What do you say? You agree? Yeah. Of course. You can't say no, Allah says so. Masih Allah is the son of Maryam. Masih Jesus the son of Mary. You can't say no. So it's a, you know, Jesus is Masih Allah. You say yes. Is Muhammad Masih Allah? Is he? You say no, he's Rasulullah. He said, look, Jesus is also Rasulullah. He's Masih Allah and Rasulullah. Your prophet is only Rasulullah. So in your mind, you feel now he's inferior to Jesus. He's only talking to you. I'm telling you, Jesus is Masihullah and your prophet is Rasul. Right? So, Jesus is Rasul and Masih. Your prophet is only Rasul. That's something there. This is, you know, Jesus Christ was born miraculously without any male intervention. The ayah I quoted to you just now, the beginning. He said, no, 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 we believe that. That he was born without any human intervention. He was born so. Was Muhammad so born? Was he? I'm telling you, was he born without a father? No. no. So, did you see? He says he's superior to Muhammad. Muhammad said, born like anybody else. Our Jesus was born without a father. So his father is God. Somebody he must have a father. If you haven't got an earthly father, you've got a heavenly father. Something there. He says, you know Jesus. He came back to the dead. What do you say? Yes. Yes. Did Muhammad give life to the dead? No. You said, well, Jesus gave by God's permission. Did Muhammad give life to the dead by God's permission? Did he? He said, not that I know. I don't know. Maybe I don't know the Hadith so well. Where is your prophet Muhammad now? He 
is, is that it's buried in Medina. So perhaps the bones are rotten in the grave? Say, no, we believe it's Hayatul Nabi, the living prophet. Yeah, yeah. Metaphysically. But physically, maybe? He says, maybe. Where is Jesus? He's resting in heaven. He's coming back. He says, yes. He says, God must have a purpose in doing that. Don't you think so? When you make Kurbani, you don't sacrifice the animal. Bakri you be punished. Huh? You look for an animal without blemish. Horns not broken. You are not cut. Not blind. Not limping. No. Perfect animal. Is that what you look for? Sheep, goat, or cow, or camel? Huh? So if God Almighty wants to make a sacrifice for this creation, to redeem mankind from their sins, would he look for second best? Would he look for that? Would he? No. No, he would look for second best. Would he? Do you look for second best? Sheep, goat, cow? No. Why would God look for second best? Stop arguing. Argue and debate. Argue with the fellow. You will come on second best. Do you know why? Because this is not your field. The Ali is not his field. You don't blame him. See, he never did this proper thing. He has been learning things. What are they learning? He's teaching you about the Salat, Sunnah, Pajit, Nafil, how miracles and this and how and how you stand and how you don't. Everything he can tell you. That's what he studied and he teaches you. That's perfect. Beautiful. But he didn't learn this. Now find the answer for Go on, look for answers. They want answers. This is what he's telling you. And we're losing our children. In South Africa, it must be happening here too. In my country, for every one boy we are losing, we're losing three girls to Christianity. Find answers. Now you'll get the answer. I don't know if you, you know, put it like you know, marshmallow in your mouth, let it in your mouth. You know, let put this nice sweet meat for me. Sweet meat, you know, the Pakistani meat. Nice and soft. Pepper in your mouth and melt in your mouth. Like Turkish delight. You know, halwa, halwa. Let's go. You only put it in your mouth. I know you all like it. Everybody likes it. You have a little injection and say, your job is done. The last few for a year at least. No. I want you to earn that. There is a book. That book is Christ in Islam. Christ in Islam. Absolutely free. Absolutely free to Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Christ in Islam. Have you got them ready? Yes. You get them from Birmingham, number 20 Green Lane. You have established Islamic propagation center in the national. You started from Durban. You got a branch here in Birmingham. And the book is available. You get all the answers there. <laughs> I know you like me to put the lucky in your mouth now. But no, you have to learn to earn things. You know, you're getting things too easy. The Muslims are getting things too easy. We offer you the Quran. The Holy Quran. This encyclopedia of nearly 2,000 pages, actually 1,920 pages, with Arabic text translation and commentary, with a comprehensive index, five pounds. Five pounds. There is no book in the UK you can buy an encyclopedia of this magnitude for five pounds. You get it. There's everything on your fingertips. What do you want to know about Islam, about Jesus, open J, everything about Jesus you find it. You want to know about marriage, you want to know about divorce, you want to know about heaven, you want to know about hell. What do you want to know? You want to know about creation. In this age when everybody is talking about the theory of evolution, so where do we stand? What does the Quran say? Open up creation. Creation of man, creation of heaven and earth. Read it, what Allah says. Everything on your fingertips. And how much? Five pounds. I know in my country I offer it to you. That if you can't afford it, free of charge. If you can't afford it, write and tell us why we should give you one for nothing. But in Britain, I can't imagine people here, they say they can't afford it. A man wrote to me to South Africa, and he cried to me. You know what he said? He said, I'm unemployed, and I've got half a dozen children, and I can't afford the Quran. And I felt pity for the man. My heart bled for him. Then I realized all of a sudden that these guys are living on the road, and the more children have, more income you get. <laughs> and I remember that I went to my people a few of years back when I came, I went to Preston, I went to Bolton, and my people, people coming from my village in India, speaking my mother tongue, relations of mine, they take me home, and they will feed me, they will give me tea and cakes. And I'm asking in my language, Islamata, 
What do you read? They don't know how to speak Persian. What do you do? It's an unemployed. You know, it's so hard for me to eat his food, drink his tea. That means I'm, I'm poor man, poor man, unemployed. I'm eating his food, good food at that, and tea and cakes. Everywhere I go, what you doing? It's unemployed. What you doing? Unemployed. Ooh, how horrible. <laughs> then my brother sent me, I said, man, I don't like this people, people treating me like this. Keep your I don't do everything. He said, no, 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 Mota is calling me, big brother. He said, don't worry, you know, on this door, we are able to send money, and I'm going to the car also. On the door. <laughs> more children we have, the more money you get. Don't tell me you can't afford it here. In my country, I don't think people, they can't afford it here. But you don't tell me you can't afford it. So, I think, you know, I can entertain these people. Actually, I mean, you like to entertain. But every time I come here, I know the young people, they really, you know, they say, ah, can you that this year? You can give us some entertainment. <laughs> I would rather stop here at this juncture. And allow you, my children, to ask questions. If you have any, say, look, man, this guy talks like this, that fellow says that. How do we meet these objections of his God Islam? Or his attack on Islam? How do we defend ourselves? I feel that I would be happier doing that on this occasion of Christmas, about Christmas. How you can take advantage of every little thing. Easter comes along, talk about crucifixion, this is, you know, what's the occasion? Talk about that. Christmas comes around, the birth of Jesus. Start talking to him about Christmas. He wants to know about Christmas. Will we celebrate? He says, look, man, like this, like that. But you know how Christmas came about? Brainwashing. Programming. Telling him that this is a pagan holiday, man. If it was the birth of Jesus, we would have been one with you. <laughs> you know, Christ was not born. Like, pass it on, pass it on. In all innocence. And the guys of entertainment. Wa Dawan and Alhamdulillah. Before the chairman puts the question to me, I prefer my children to stand up and put the question. That those people will be given the first question. I tell you why. You have to acquire the ability to stand up and speak. Because I have found in the Malaysian hall here in London, they invited me to deliver a lecture. At the end of the lecture, question time, no question, only from Christians. They stood up and asked questions. The Malay Muslim, no question. But when they said, now you can put it in writing, there was a flood. There was a flood of things. <laughs> yes. Why? Now you remain like that, like dumb creatures. Stand up and speak, man. Make a fool of yourself in public. One day, inshallah, you'll be able to do a better job. Stand up and put this tough question. My sisters, I don't mind just any notes. But you people, come on. Get up and ask questions. Acquire that ability. Yes. <laughs> inshallah, we're going to get used to old life, inshallah. So we we'll start away, we we'll start straight away, the questions and the answers. So inshallah, I'll wait for some questions from the sisters to come on table. I'll, I'll put these here now. So inshallah, I'll try to make some sort of balance between one question from the brothers and from this sister. So inshallah, who would like to ask a question? Yes, yeah. Uh, how can we speak to the atheists who don't believe in any book or who, who, who do not like, uh, consider our holy book Quran or saying it's silly? I will repeat that question in case people at the back might not have heard my son there. How do we speak to the atheists when the guy doesn't believe in God, he doesn't any book, nothing, how do you speak to him? Well, you know, to me it's very easy. And I can tell you it's also very easy. He is the best customer. The atheist, the agnostic, is a better customer than the Hindu, the Jew, or the Christian. 
you know, actually, from the religious point of view, a person who says he doesn't believe in God, who says he's a kafir, and he's supposed to be the furthest, furthest away from us. But in modern times, when a te the fellow tells you he's a atheist, or he's an agnostic, I say he is the best customer. I will tell you why. You see, I, I discovered this in the Holy Quran. Allah Ta'ala wants us to find common cause, common grounds between yourself and your recipient of your message. Like, for example, Allah says, Qul, tell her, Ya Ahlal Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala, come, ila karimatin sawa in bainana wa bainakum, that we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And this is the secret with anybody. In the first instance with the Jews and the Christians, find common cause, common grounds to start off with, from. And with them, Allah says, what to start with? So number one, Allah, illallah, that we worship none but Allah, because they already believe that they worship in God. They believe in Allah. So like, let's worship the one and only God. And that we associate no partners with him. And that we do not take from among ourselves laws and patrons other than Allah. But if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims. We have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Common ground. Find common ground. Is anybody willing to everybody? everybody? How do you find common ground with atheists? The man says he doesn't believe in God, and you say, yes, also, I don't believe in God. <laughs> I said, yes. What? <coughs> you see, when a man tells me that, that he is an atheist, I don't believe in God, I say, congratulations. If you tell me, if I ask you, what are you? You say, I'm a Muslim. No congratulations. You know why? Because your father was a Muslim, your mother was a Muslim. This young fellow, he says he's a Christian. No congratulations to him. Because his father was a Christian, his mother was a Christian. Can you see? But when the guy says he's an atheist, I say congratulations. Why? Because he's been thinking. Well, how did he reach that stage to say there is no God? His background. Where does he come from? He comes from his background, his Christianity, his Bible, his book. And he's been reading the book, he's heard from his environment the concept of God. In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, he has been reading, but he has been told, he has heard in Sunday school, that God Almighty made Adam and Eve, and he put them in the garden with instructions, eat of the plentiful things here, herein, except the tree in the midst of the garden, that tree, that fruit thou shalt not eat, because the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, and shaitan. The devil makes his face seen into them, tempted them, and they act. And when they act, according to the Bible, they were eating from the tree of knowledge. So, knowledge came to them, they realized that they were naked. Prior to that, they were in a state of felicity. In a sense, they didn't know that they were naked. Now they started plucking leaves, putting it on themselves, says the Bible. And Adam heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, in the evening period, he hears footsteps. You know the earth must be shaking. This mighty King Kong, you know, millions and millions of times bigger than man, walking in the garden, Adam heard the footsteps, so he hides himself away in the bushes. So God comes and stands. I'm only reading the Bible, his Bible, which he has been reading which had brought him to this atheism. How did he come there? I'm showing you how he came there. I know, his background. So, God comes and stands where Adam was a few seconds before, and he shouts, Adam, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> Poor God, he didn't know where Adam was. <laughs> or maybe he was playing hide and seek. <laughs> you know, I play with my grandson, my grandson, a little fellow, about two and a half year old. When I go home, he's there, and I shout, Reis, Reis, that's his name. Reis, to Kache, where are you? And he's laughing. <laughs> Grandpa can't see. <laughs> like that. And that's Allah also, you know, he wants to have a little change. That's the monotony of being alone. <laughs> so, so, Adam, Adam, where are thou? So, Adam peeps through the bushes. And <laughs> He said, if you behave like that, you have been up to mischief, you must have done something wrong. Why do you behave like that? 
So Adam says, it is not me, it is a woman that God gave us to me, she made me to eat. In other words, if you didn't give me that woman, I would be in trouble. But you have got to be blamed. Why did you give me that woman? That cow. I was my father. It's the woman that God gave us to me, she made me eat. And the woman is a, a serpent that defied him, passing the buck. You know, the oldest game in the world. Now, when you read this, you have my prediction of God. He's an anthropomorphic god, a god after a woman's pattern. Then further down, you read about Hazrat Musa salam, Moses. He says, Oh Lord, I want to see you. In the Quran, Allah says, Lam Tarani, you shall never see me. In the Bible, he's persistent. He says, I love you so much, I want to see you. Don't show yourself to me. Stubborn, that's stubborn children. Sometimes you hear with them. So Allah writes, Hazrat Musa in the Bible. He said, Alright, you know, I shall put you between two rocks, big rocks. And in the opening, he puts his hand. And he turns his back, and he takes away his hand. And Moses saw the back of God, his backside. As the friend was to go he might have been to go So he shows him his backside. And God has got a backside, he's got a front side. No? If you've got a backside, then you've got a front side. If you've got a front side and a backside, you've got a top side and a bottom side. No? Reason, logic, human logic, reason. If you've got a top side and a bottom side, then you're located somewhere. If you are located somewhere, I have a right to demand on you to see him. And if I don't see him, I have a right to deny him. Look, this is logic. Simple reasoning. So Gagarin, the Russian astronaut, when he returned from orbit, you know, he went round and round and round, around, the first guy to go round and round the earth so many times, and he came back, and newspapers of the world carried banner headlines. In my country especially, from one end of the newspaper to the other, he says, where is your God? Where are your angels? Question mark. Okay. You want to know where is your God? Where are these angels you're talking about? Millions of them. Where are they? So I drew an attention of a Christian missionary who was visiting me at the time. I said, Look what Gagarin is asking. So he said, He's a fool. Who? Gagarin is a fool. I said, No, he's not a fool. You are a fool. <laughs> it is a concept you gave him. You gave him a concept of God that is old father Christmas. Santa Claus, sitting on some place with his, dad, with his feet, dangling onto the other his footstool. The heaven is his canopy, the loving father in heaven. Millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man. That is the concept you gave him. And angels were beautiful women with wings, well proportioned, 36, 24, 36. You know? <laughs> well proportioned with wings. And that is the concept you gave him. And today, because he can't see, he denies them. You blame him? No. That person. That Asian, that agnostic has taken the first step in the path of Islam towards Islam. The very first words of the Kalima that we have to utter. If you convert somebody, what do you say? Start. How? Salaha ilaha. Don't you start with la? La, you are the first word of the Kalima. La, what is la? No, ilaha. God, there is no God. Don't you say that? Can you become a Muslim without that? He's taken the first step. He says, La ilaha. He said that, meaning to say, La ilaha. That's all. <laughs> Look, when he says, La ilaha, what ilaha? He said that one who walks in the garden, does he believe? He says, no. I'm asking, do you believe in that God who walks in the garden in the midst of the day? Do you believe in him? That there is such a God who plays hide and seek with his creation? Do you believe in a God like that? Do you believe in a God that Moses could see his backside? Do you believe in a God like that? You also say the same thing. What are you saying? You're saying that. So congratulate him. He said, congratulations. He said, look, the reason why you're thinking that of that is just great, man. You have discovered the truth. He said, these are not Ilaha. Rama is not God. Krishna is not God. Jesus is not God. The one who walked in the garden is not God. He said, La Ilaha. There are no Ilaha. There are no gods. And you do need to love God. There is a And you start reasoning with him. He has taken the first step, my son. Congratulations. Right. Whatever you say. <laughs> one, one point. This is what he's making about the color. There is no color in Islam. Why the reference to white man? There are no white. Uh, there are many white Muslims. So this is a commitment which, inshallah, you you elaborate on or clarify. You see, uh, I'm an old man of 68. I can't remember all these things in my head. Let me finish it off. 
I think you see, you must understand my problem. I am coming from an environment which is color conscious. Everything is color, color, color. South Africa. We are all divided into color. And I don't know in what context I mentioned white. White in the sense that the people feel that they are superior because of the color, the European. In my country, in South Africa, we feel inferior to them. In India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, wherever you are, we subject people, the white man, the white man, the European, he ruled the Indonesians for 300 years. How do you feel? Inferior. A handful of them ruled India for 100 years. A handful of them. We had so many million, 300 million at that time. And a handful of white rulers, how do you feel? So, from that point of view, the guy is a Christian. He is invariably the guy who comes and knocks at your door. In my country, it's not the Negro, not the African, it's not the other Indian, it's not the color, it's the white man, the European. I'm not talking as a racist. I know, in the sight of Allah, the only standard given to us in the Holy Quran is inna akaranakum in the Mayaqa. Most certainly, the noblest in the sight of Allah is he who is the best in conduct. Not black or white, not rich or poor, not European or Asiatic, the best in conduct. But you must understand in the context of what we are talking, I'm not saying that no white man can be a Muslim. We have our Muslim brothers and we are happy to have them with us. But I'm not talking in the racial, racial terms. Okay, inshallah, I just asked the question. That was just to clarify the point of color. So I hope inshallah it is clear now. So how can a Muslim justify another prophet after Isa alayhi salam? Because people would say, we believe in Jesus, peace be upon him, but why should we believe in the Rasul alayhi salam? Very, very easy to justify. This is what Jesus said. Jesus himself put the words into his mouth in the Holy Quran, we are told, وَمُوَشِّرًا بِرَسُولِ يَعْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ سُمُوهُ أَحْمَدِ and he gave glad tidings of the Prophet to come after him, whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad. But in the Bible, in his own Bible, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How big? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will come into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things he shall be here, that shall he speak, and he shall be clear unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. So he's talking about somebody else who's going to come after him, who will guide mankind into all truth. Who is that spirit of truth? They said the Holy Ghost. I said, now, nah, what did the Holy Ghost teach you in 2000 years? Any church, give me one new thing. I said, you see, in English, when he said, I have yet many things to say, many is more than one. He will guide you to all truth, all is more than one. He said, yes. I have only one. Give me one new thing. And in 40 years, no Christian with the name has been able to produce one. New thing. What Jesus Christ could not have given you in so many different words. Not one. See? I said, look, if we read this, we read this prophecy verse from the Bible with a little emphasis on the pronoun. I said, you will see that Jesus is not speaking about the ghost because they're talking about the Holy Ghost. Listen, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How we? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you to all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify him. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. It ill befits a ghost. You agree? The ghost is spiritually hit, hit, hit. <laughs> this is he, 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 he. Talking about a man, a man, a man, a man. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he guided mankind into all truth. Meaning, all your problems, solution to all your problems, he gives you the answers. It might not go down well, because you have grooved into a different type of behavior. It's difficult to get out of the groove. Groove, you know, groove, you get that groovy feeling in the groove, you know. And the difference in the, between the groove and the grain is only depth. How much the one is deeper than the other? Grey. In the grey. When you are there, nice, comfortable, groovy feeling. And when you want to get a guy out of that, he's very uncomfortable. Out of the groove. So, they are grouped in into a certain form of behavior. But answers to your problems, the problem of surplus women, Islam gives you. 
The problem of alcoholism, Islam gives you the answer. Of gambling, Islam gives anything. Of racism, Islam gives you the answer. It's my point, we aware. He is the spirit of truth who guides mankind all through. Now, also, get another book from the Islamic Propagation Center International in Birmingham, what the Bible says about Muhammad. Look, you owe it to yourself. Free books, free literature. Get it for yourself. If you want more to send to your homeland, your motherland, then I hope you try and find out. So look, I want 50 copies to send to Indonesia, or Malaysia, or Bangladesh, to my people. Find out how much does each copy cost. So it says you send pens each. Then if you want 100, send a thousand pens. You'll get them, you see? Send them to your country. But for yourself, absolutely free, all literature, printed by the Islamic Propagation Center. What you might not be available here at the moment, write to South Africa, and we'll send them down to you from there. Away, actually away from the subject that you talk is just as a matter of interest since you are from South Africa. Uh, I saw some demonstration in the TV that Muslim brothers were uh, demonstrating and they were holding banners and uh, there were some motors of uh, Imam Khomeini about it. Could you possibly, it's interesting for me to see why is, uh, is it there? The Muslim in South Africa we are less than 2% of the population. For every two Muslims, there are 98 non-Muslims in South Africa. We are less than 2%. But in the political struggle, more than 20% of the people who make sacrifices with their lives are Muslims. More than 20%. We are less than 2%, but we make more than 20% of the sacrifices. You never heard about Imam Abdullah Harun. He gave his life in prison. Ahmad Habiji. He was like in prison. Ahmad Timur, he was like in prison. Dr. Yusuf Dadu had to flee for his life. Maulana Kachali had to flee for his life. No, you never hear about them. You only about Biko, Biko, Biko. So you think Biko is the man. The Muslims have you know, sacrificed more than 20% than any other people in the country. With regards to Imam Khomeini, uh, there are no Shias in South Africa. There are no Shias. All the people that I know, they are all Sunnis with uh, the Hanafi school of thought or the Shafi school of thought. Hanafi is the Shafi. There were no Malakis, no Hanbalis, no Shia. There were only Hanafis and Shafis. Most of the Malays from Malaysia and Indonesia, about half of the population are Shafis, and my people, most of us, are Hanafis from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. Imam Khomeini has become the hero, because in recent times, he is the only Muslim who has been standing up to the big shaitan. America. You see, he's the only one who has done it so far. So naturally, you know, the people feel that he's a hero and put that spirit in the land that we do, you know, we are small as we are, as few as we are, we can also stand up before the government. I think that is the spirit behind Imam Khomeini's program, if you saw it. Just as if you know that they have proved the point. But I said, look, the whole thing is taken out of your book. 
the Bible, the verse in the Trinity, the whole thing is thrown out. So if this was a valid doctrine, if this was a valid doctrine, then why should it be taken out of the Bible? In every modern translation of the Bible, the verse on the Trinity, the clearest statement of the Trinity, happens to be in, as I mentioned then, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For oh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, standing for Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the nearest, closest to the Holy Trinity. That verse is now expunged from all modern translations of the Bible as an interpolation, as a fabrication, as an adulteration. So if this was your very doctrine, why is it thrown out? Allah tells us, Wala Tell them, tell them, don't say Trinity. In Tawu Khairullah, stop it. This is will be better for you. In Namallah Wila Wahid, for you Allah is one Allah, is not three in one, is not one in three. Is the most nonsensical idea. Jesus Christ never preached it. Of course, it's a, it's a subject by itself. I can teach you and explain to you the verses from the Bible when Jesus says that God is one. When he's asked by a learned man of the Jew, Master, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him in the Hebrew language, Shama Israel Adonai Rahainu Adonai Echa. It means here, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He didn't say three in one. Actually, uh, during my discussion with some uh, Christians, what I try to do, I try to, to direct them toward the Quran. But what I find difficult really is to guide these people to the Quran, they stubborn to read this Quran. What the, what is the secret behind it? Could you read it very well? Uh, the question was that our brother is finding a little difficulty in getting the Christian to approach the Quran. So he wants to know what is the secret, how, how do you do the job. See, in the Holy Quran, Allah describes the Jews and the Christians to us. He says, Kuntum khaira ummatin nas, that you Muslims are the best of people evolved for mankind. Because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. and you believe in Allah. That's half a verse. The continuation is, But if the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, it will be better for them, in other words, it will be better for you. Among them there are good people. Mu'min! I do not want to give credit to them that they are Mu'mins among them, that they are hardly any Mu'mins among us. You know, not are Muslims. And we say we have submitted, but Islam has not really entered our hearts. It's about us. But Allah says, Min humul mu'minuna, among them, among the Jews and the Christians, there are Mu'min. But after humul fa'atun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. So you have been coming across perverted transgressors. Now, there are ways. Allah is telling you that there is one group who is a Mu'min and there are others that are perverted transgressors. Pasipun. So you have to treat them differently. But we assume that we are treating with a Mu'min. Anytime you come across a man, we have to treat him as a Mu'min. That should be the Muslim attitude. And to the Mu'min, this is the way. Among the Jews and the Christians. You tell the Father. So you know we believe in Jesus. Like this, that you believe in Jesus. So what? Generally, so what? He's thinking that you tend to carry with him. You want something nice from him, maybe a chocolate or a cigarette you want to get. He says, You believe in Jesus. He's one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe he's the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth, which many many modern day Christians don't believe today. The own people they don't believe that it was born miraculously. We believe that he gave back to the dead by God's permission. He used the born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We believe in all that. He's shocked. He's thinking that you're trying to carry favor with him. That you scratch his back, he'll scratch your back. You say a few good words about his Jesus, he might say a few good words about our Muhammad. That's what he's thinking. So he says, you know what my book says? No. Open the book. The Quran. Where? Surah Al-Imran. 
the book of Jesus, starting with chapter 3, verse 42. Start. Start. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Such an honor is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even the Christian Bible. Read it to him. Worship <laughs> To pronounce Allah's words, because His words carry an impact, a power, which your words can't be produced. Allow Him to do the talking, and He is talking Himself. Allah, let Him do the talking, let Him be your advocate. And see the response. Good person. See how He responds, how she responds, you see. The perverted transgressor, ah, he's you know, spanking, he making a mockery of it. You know now, nah, he's not the guy. So you take out the stick, the big stick, and give you the big stick. They are basically every passion. You see what they call the third degree. You know the third degree? In black belt, you got what's the black belt? Is it? Between the third degree. He's saying, Udu Chau Baila, the 14th time. You know? Why? Because my book is the Bible of all the world. The God that never wore. These are all the armaments now to fight the other fellow. You see? So now it depends on the customer. You meeting the professional. The professional who comes to your door, he is not there to listen to you. He was pushing things down your throat. So with that, so wait, 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 wait. You get the Bible? This is about wooden and What do you want me to do? Really, he wants you to read the Quran and take the Bible. He wants you to exchange the Quran for the Bible. Throw the Quran away. The Bible is good for good. See, you see? Let's have a look. Let me get my book. And I tell you, these verses mark it in red. And you know why you're marking in red. These verses you marking in green. Then you know why you're marking those in green. These verses you marking in yellow. You know why you're marking them in yellow. So it becomes a color for the Bible. Get one free from the Christian. But you must get my book. And you mark it as I instruct you. Then you have a Bible color coded for you. He says, you know, this is the book of God. He says, yes. He says, you know, please open up Genesis chapter 19. Let him open. Verse 30 on verse 3. Daughters prohibited with the fathers night after night. This is the Lutheran Islam and his daughters. Because the daughters want to carry the father's seed. Huh? Word of God? What a noble idea. Daughters want to carry the father's seed that they may carry on the name of the father. Luther Islam and his intercourse is with his own daughters night after night according to the Holy Bible. Holy Bible. And both the daughters are allowed to be a child by their father. And the first one gave birth to a son, and she called his name Amon, and the other one she called him Moab, and Amon the had the Ammonites and the Moabites. And God, God loved so much that when the Bani Israel they came out of Egypt, they were told to kill the Philistine men, women, and children. Kill them all, even suck things are not to be spent, even donkeys they kill. But the children of the Moabites and the Ammonites you must not touch. Because the children of Lord, Father and God, are in of all. That offspring, you mustn't touch them. He loved them so much. Holy. Chapter 35, verse 22. Reuben, the son of Yaakov al Islam, he has, he probably with his mother on the roof, that the whole of Israel can see what's going on on the roof with his mother. Then, Genesis chapter 38. Judah, the father of the Jewish race, he goes and bargains with his daughter in law and he makes her pregnant on the roadside. Filthiest, dirtiest religious book on earth. Shah Bernard Shah, he said, Keep it in the lock and key. Too dangerous for your children to have a sister. But of course, you're not a child. You can have it. <laughs> so, hey, that's a third degree, you know? He said, Just give it to him. That Hadith, he needs it. He deserves it. You start with the approach I'm telling you, the Quran, this is Allah's Salah. He starts making a mockery of Islam, of the Prophet, and he says about Khomeini and Iraq, and Iran works. And he starts talking like that. So, what do you want? Do you want me to take this book and take yours? Let's have a look what I'm offering. Okay? So ask him to open the book. 
There are four different types of incest in the first book of the Bible. As it is a textbook, if you want to commit incest, there are four different ways you can commit incest. You know what's incest? You know what is incest? How would you all know what is incest? You know what is incest? Huh? You see, when you commit with somebody else's wife or daughter, it is adultery, sinner. But when you meet with your own mother, when you meet with your daughter, when you meet with your daughter-in-law, when you meet with the sister, that is called incest. Okay? Yes. Now you know, there are four different types of incest in the first book of the Bible alone. And this is a textbook. If you want to commit incest, four different ways you can do it. That is the book, the Bible. But we don't start with that. We start with all humility, Guru Vidasa, Vidya Rabbika, Vidya Hikmati, Srivai God with the ways of the Lord, with wisdom, with Mawrazatil Hasanati, and with beautiful preaching, Vashadil Humbilati Asan, and wisdom with them the ways that are best and most gracious. And I'm telling you how to do it. But now the guy starts being funny, clever, he wants to make things around you, he wants to make a nest in your head, he wants to be used as a punching bag, he wants to use it as a doormat. Don't allow you to do that. You give it to him, and he'll never talk in a Muslim door again. You, you refer to the atheist to be better than the Christian, because he has made sense of what the Bible is. But the Unicor Am refers to the Christians and Jews as the evil of the book. So the Unicor Am uh, gives them some sort of special reference. So what's your comment on that? I'm not again saying that. Allah gives them that these are the fittest people to receive the message. You see, in the verse I quoted you, that Allah appoints us as the Khayna Ummati, the best of people, evolved for mankind. Your qualifications, ta'muruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhawna li munka. That you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. This honor was to be shared. And the very first people with whom you must share this are the Jews and the Christians. Because they were prepared to receive this message. So, Allah al-Kitab. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, the Quran says again and again. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, O people of the book, O people of the book, La tablu fi dinikum, do not put extremes in your religion. Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Ta'ala, O people of the book, come. First address is to the Jews and the Christians. Right? You are addressing what is prepared to receive the message. Is the time? I said, now, in that there is resistance, there is prejudice. He's been programmed, the Christians, especially, and the Jew. The Jews that we are the chosen people. We are the children of Abraham. And we are the sons of David. We are the chosen people. Now they are programmed that okay? way. So now there's a prejudice. This is who? Islam came to Muhammad Sallam. He was the son of Ismail. You know, Ismail was the son of a bond woman, a slave woman from Africa, Hajra. And now this prejudice is being cultivated. So in other words, the prejudices are greater. In the Jew and the Christians said, Look, we God, the veritable Son of God. He died for our Son. God came down birth as a man and he sacrificed his life. What do we need anything anymore? Prejudices are already cultivated. The uh, atheist and the agnostic one. A. He has got no prejudice. He's got prejudice in general against religion, his conception that everybody has. He is against his also superstition. You tell him Rama is God? He says, Rubbish, what are you talking about? Is a Krishna is God, so what are you talking about? Is a Buddha is God, so what are you talking about? Is a Jesus is God, so what? A child born in the stable to a Jewish girl, circumcised on the eighth day, God, the maker of this universe, what's wrong with you? Are you a fool? Are you mad? If you are a nurse helping Mary when she was delivering the child, can you for one moment think that that is your God coming out of a woman's body? Hmm? With all the fruit on the mouth and circumcised on the eighth day, your God? No, he's laughing at you if you said he's God. We also laugh at the same thing. No, how can God be circumcised? How can God be carried by a woman for nine months? He's on the same wavelength as you. I'm talking about the atheists and the agnostics of today. I'm not talking about the cartoons and bushes of Makkah 1400 years ago. I'm talking about the modern man. His prejudices are careful. His prejudice against religion because of all his superstition. So, we know. Congratulate him, psychology, psychology, come, come man, I'm one with you. I also don't believe in a God who walked in the garden. I don't believe in a God that Moses could see his backside. I don't believe in a God that was born of a woman, that a woman carried him for nine months. So, I'm one with you. But God was 
Allah. It's this God. I'm talking to him, explaining to him, showing him what Allah says, how he speaks in the Quran. He doesn't speak like the other books. He's not talking dogmatically, he's reasoning with you. كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ So how can you not believe in Allah? وَكُنْتُمْ مَمْوَاتًا Seeing that you were non-existent, you were dead, you were non-existent, فَأَحْيَاكُمْ And He brought you to life, ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ And He caused you to die, ثُمَّ يُحْيِكُمْ And He bring you back to life again, ثُمَّ يِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And to Him will be your return. Reason. For the time, when there was no existence, this earth was a mortal mass, no life could have ever, ever existed here. Millions of years ago, no life, nothing! And over here, Yes, billions. Yes, according to you, according to the scientists, they start cooling and cooling, and after billions of years, years life originated in the sea. He says, after billions of years, protoplasm, you know, amoeba, whatever, life started in the sea, in the water, in the ocean. That's what the Quran is telling you. Kaifata kuruna billah. Avalam yara lazina kafaru. So do not the unbelievers see, the atheists and agnostics can they see? Awalam yalla zina kafaru, anna samawati wal arda, kana tadatkan, that the heavens and the earth be joined together as one unit of creation, fafatakna huma, and you split them asunder, wajahalna minal ma'i kulla shayin, hurry! And you smear from water every living thing, afala yumin, will you then not believe who? The Arabs? The Badoons? No! He's talking to you, the modern man, the man of science, man of learning, who says life originated in the sea, and yet you say there is no God. You talk to him. Where did this man get this from? That life originated in the water. You don't need interpretation. So, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَعْنِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْءٍ And it's made from water every living thing. أَفَلَا يُمِنُونَ Will you then not believe? Talk to him. Talk to him. Please. Inshallah, you will get a better head with the atheists and the agnostics than the Christians and the uh, Jews. Yes, yeah. Uh, Shaykh, uh, I'm interested to know the difference in the set, different set of the Christianity. We know that the Christians there are <coughs> Protestant, Catholic, Catholic, witnesses, and so on. Can I know the historically background, how the difference rise, and how can we change from the from their differences? The question was, my someone should know about the differences between the Christian sects. There are a thousand different sects and denominations among the Christians. A thousand. You want to know them all? <laughs> no, you don't need, you don't need, you don't need to know all this. Waste of time. The bulk of Christendom believes in the Bible as the word of God. Take the Bible away from him, meaning show him that this is not, if he comes to an argument, that is not the word of God. Whoever comes, Jehovah's Witness, same Bible. See that variation, in terms of translation, don't worry. It basically is the same Bible. What I told you about the four types of incest in the first book, is in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, is in the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, it is in the authorized, authorized King James version of the Bible. Every Bible in the world has it. This is pornography, the highest form of pornography. As a kid, chapter 23, I can't quote it because my children, my daughters are here. Others are the food, it is banned in South Africa. They are banned verses of the Bible, not knowing that this was a Bible. Somebody sent a pamphlet with those verses from the Bible. Filthy, dirty thing. No decent man can read this to his mother, his sister, his daughter, or even his fiancée if she's a good woman. You can't read it. Filthy, dirty book. So, a, a new convert sister of ours, a white lady, I'm not a racist, a white girl. She <laughs> carries some weight in the She's a white person, right? See, with a white name. In the white area coming from there, carries more weight. She sent it to the censorship board that this thing here is horrible. You must do something about it, or you're going to take matters in your own hands. So the censorship board shows us, look, wait a minute, we will do something, and within two weeks, they ban this, all those verses. And every verse is word for word from the Holy Bible. Filthy, beauty book that the Christians themselves have banned in South Africa. Huh? So this is it, every book. You don't have to go into details about the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. They are the difference between the two, the Protestant world, whether it's a Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Church of England, 
The difference between them and the Roman Catholics is the difference between Tweedle them and Tweedle Lee. You know that? Tweedle them and Tweedle Lee. You know when you were little children, you were looking at Tweedle them and Tweedle Lee. You know the guy who fell from the. There's some, some poetry. You know that there's really little no difference. They are the same. They are like two brothers. Glad that you take it. It's a one from here and one from the floor. Last. Okay, I just. <laughs> so this is just sent. I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize what's written in there. One of the churchmen complained because there was a Christmas card showing naked Virgin Mary in bed with Archangel Gabriel. The card shows Angel Gabriel asking Mary, "What time did you say Joseph get back from his work?" And the company refused to withdraw the cars from the market. So it's just showing you how those people are making fun from their religion, even to that extent. Um, the question from the sister's side was about the reaction of Christians to your talks about Islam and about Christianity and is the Pope going to meet you as he promised? <laughs> <laughs> the reactions are always the same. There are people among the people of the Book of Jews and the Christians who hear your point of view and they appreciate it. And there is a person among them you'll find that he is exactly as the Quran says perverted transgressor. I'm just telling you, these are the two types of people you find them all the time. There is a good type of fellow, you know, sensible fellow says, no, I can see your point of view, I can see your point of view, I can see your point of view. And there's another, now what you do, you can bring the moon down and put it in his hand, it won't work. So, this is a natural thing, but now, for us is you go out and deliver the message. It is not for you to know what fruits you're going to get, what results. Because Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَمْ زَكِّرْ So you, you deliver the message because it is your duty to deliver the message. لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرْ Allah says that you will not be questioned regarding them إِلَّا مُنْ تَوَلَّ وَكَفَرْ Why they accepted or why they didn't accept, Allah won't ask you. He will only ask you, did you deliver the message? That's all. That's your job. You do your job. It's not for you to reason why. It is for you just to do or die. That's your job. Go out and do the job. Fruits, leave Allah. Yusuf Ali, in one of his commentaries, poetic commentaries, he says, it's a fight the good fight. You know, put up a good struggle. But dispute not about the prize, what you're going to get. That is for God to give. It's a man of faith, act and obey. Men of faith, you people who believe, act and obey. It is no better to fight for truth than to seek good decay. The pure in faith, God will give the mind and the resources to conquer. He will give you the mind and the resources to conquer. They will fight with no thought of ever turning back. With that mentality, when you go forward, says victory sure to come. So the victory should be ascribed to God, not men. Go out and do the job. Put up a good fight. Put up a good struggle. Don't worry about the prize. Also, the possibility about the meeting with the Pope. Ah, uh, this is holding with the Pope. You see, he has been going out to Muslim countries. And when he went to Turkey, his holiness, the Pope, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Nigeria, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Kenya, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. Who is this we? We. We. The Roman Catholic Church. What is the dialogue? Dialogue is a two-way process. Is that what he means? No. Actually, he's telling his people, go and convert the Muslims. They're already prepared to receive that message. Who are the Muslims? Look, the Muslim is the nearest to the Christian. You don't have to convince a Muslim that Jesus is the Christ. You don't have to convince a Muslim that you born miraculously. You don't have to convince a Muslim that he gave you life to the dead by God's permission and he gave those born blind on the level by God's permission. He believes! without any proof required. What he needs is a gentle push. Christianizing. Showing that Christ died for his sin. That is all. So he is prepared from the Christian point of view 
from an Islamic point of view, we say Allah says the Jews and the Christians will prepare to receive this message. Now they are telling you because you didn't do the job, they are saying now that the Muslim is prepared to receive our message. So dialogue, not dialogue is telling people don't convert them. But if you use the word convert, we are going to react. When you see this guy coming with his dog color in your home Sunday morning, Sarah is going to steal your children. Get rid of him somehow. You know, this hadith, get him out of the way. And if he comes along, he said, I'd like to have a dialogue with you. He's holding this, the Pope tells him, you must talk with you. Have a dialogue with you. You can't say no. Because Allah tells us to have a dialogue with him. Qul, ya ahlal kitab al. Have a dialogue with him. Allah tells you to have a dialogue with him. And if he's talking about dialogue, you can't say no. But you'll come on second guest. Because you're not equipped. You're not trained for that. Our learned men are not trained for that. That is what he's telling me. So I know the game. Because I'm in the game. So I write to him, I said, Your Holiness, you are free for a dialogue, I am prepared to come along and have a dialogue with you. In St. Peter's in Rome, it's a huge place, I saw it. I said, I am prepared to come over any time that suits you. Time and date, tell me, I will come. We don't want to give you trouble to come to Africa, to the land of apartheid. No, no, we will come to your door, at your convenience. No reply. So I sent him another letter. No reply. I sent him a telegram. No reply. I sent him another telegram. So she replies, he's prepared to receive me in the secretariat, in private. Now this is not a matter between Ahmad Didat and the Pope. It's a matter between Islam and Christianity. The world must know what's going on. So we write back to him. We say, how big is your secretariat? Because there are three plain loads of young men. They want to charter plane from South Africa, from Durban, Johannesburg and Cape Town. They want to come for the dialogue. My brother in, in, in the UK, they want to come. My brother in the uh, Amiras, they want to come. I said, how big is your secretariat? No reply. Then another letter, no reply. We said, a telegram, no reply. How big is your secretariat? The TV networks of the world want to cover it. The news media of the world want to cover it. How big is the secretariat? No reply. So Allah Bari Ta'ala, he sends me, he makes somebody to send me a letter with a picture of the Pope. I don't know whether you've seen it. You know, playing hide and seek. Did you see that? Yeah. Is it in my head? So that's the answer. You see, Allah Bari Ta'ala doesn't send Jibril anymore. Jibril is retired. You know that? Jibreel Islam doesn't come anymore. If somebody tells you here, watch this, you need a psychiatrist for <laughs> He's retired, he's done his job. So Allah Paritara is still who he's working. He's still working. He's not going to sleep. He's activating people. Somebody sent me the picture. I said, right, that's a message. He's playing hide and seek. So I printed a million of that. He's going to play hide and seek with Muslims. That's the <laughs> First, I know that many of you would like to ask questions, and many sisters have sent questions. But I'm afraid we have to take into consideration that Brother Ahmed Didat gave Juma prayer kutbah today in Birmingham, and he traveled straight away to come here to us to Derby to give us this lecture and to answer our questions. So I suppose you understand that he's tired, although he's willing to answer all your questions. So inshallah, we would like to thank him very much for the effort he did, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him the help and the effort and keep him for us to work, inshallah, for this land. So inshallah, we close this session. Um, the sisters guys to proceed to the dining hall, all of the brothers shall. Thank you.